I'm Dan Anson. I'm founder and president of Brick Simple. Uh, as John mentioned, we're headquartered outside of Philadelphia with offices in Philadelphia, as well as an office in Boston and San Francisco. And what I wanted to share, and when I spoke with John, I wanted to share things that we've been working on, real world type applications. And often we're going through these pieces, we see, oh, this is a concept, this is a demo that was created. I wanted to share some real world use of these technologies, particularly in healthcare. And the reason being is that healthcare is an area where there is actual investment being made in AR, VR. Po folks ask me that when is AR and VR, when are they going to land? When are they really going to land? And they certainly ha haven't landed for consumers yet. But where they really have taken hold is in healthcare use cases, even more than industrial use cases. And I wanted to share some examples today of some things that we worked on which really show the potential of this technology. And my presentation is going to start big. And by big, this is a proton beam uh, machine for proton beam therapy used to treat cancer. And uh, if you haven't seen one of these machines in your day-to-day -day life, you're lucky. But these therapies are hugely beneficial. And these machines are building size. You see this massive machine around. These buildings cost the buildings, machines, facilities. The facilities cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And they have patients going through them 24-7. So how do you train someone to use one of these machines? How do you train someone to go and work through this facility? And the way you can do that is you're not going to do that with an AR experience. You have to do that in a VR experience and scale. And this here is the experience that we created uh, with Penn Medicine in Philadelphia that actually is a full scale uh, recreation of the facility. And you can fully operate the machine within this virtual reality simulation. It's designed to train them. It even includes the waiting room area. All the details are captured for this high fidelity VR experience. And when we've talked about VR experiences, I mean, there, and it's been alluded to earlier, the cost of putting these things together, this is a machine that can't be interrupted in its regular operation. So by providing this kind of experience that can allow you to experience the center, literally know where things are at, know where the corners, know where the decorations are, have that be available for training is a huge asset in a very sophisticated, extraordinarily expensive facility like this. But VR, of course, isn't just for these types of grand scale things. They're also for these smaller scale things that take place in hospitals where we're dealing with patient care. And one of the things that I find interesting is so often you hear about people talking about AR and VR for surgery and involving you know, surgeons and doctors. The reality is some of the biggest impact that you can have in a healthcare system isn't with the doctors, it's the nurses. For a given hospital, you may have you know, a couple hundred amazing doctors, physicians, and you have several thousand nurses who are responsible for patient care. And we do a, a lot of work in Philadelphia, next to Boston, is a big area for health care and hospital innovation. We've done a lot of work with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and they wanted to improve how nurses are onboarded with the various procedures they go through and what happens in rooms of patient care. So what we did is we worked with them and we created a virtual reality experience that allows them, and this runs on a portable virtual reality device, like an Oculus Quest, a, a lower cost device, uh, allows them to go through and understand the practices that exist within the hospital in a high fidelity type of training experience. And this kind of training is great because not only does it deliver that experience, but using virtual reality or augmented reality, when we're tracking the movements of the user aware, we also collect very interesting data in terms of how they're performing these activities. We can use deep learning also to understand whether they're deviating from those practices involved. So it's a huge opportunity for these kinds of systems and experiences to drive this forward. It's not just about doctors and nurses. It's also about patients and the patient experience. And here, the gentleman you see here, he is wearing an HTC Vive. He's also wearing a weighted vest. And he's wearing these hand trackers. And what this experience is for, this experience is for nurses and caregivers and physicians to understand 
what someone is going through when they experience a particular disease state. We've done a few of these. This is for hyperphosphatasia. Uh, it puts you basically in the place of the patient. And we do some interesting things to do that. There's the weighted vest. You have certain things that you experience when you're going through the experience itself. We do interesting little tricks here, like that milk carton is heavily weighted so that you see milk carton, the experience, you pick it up and you feel that. And another experience we, we created, we demonstrated visual degradation, but a side effect of this disease as, as, you, as you experience the onset is slurred speech. So what we did is we actually used a, a feedback characteristic where if you play someone's voice back to them with a 100 some odd millisecond uh, delay, their speech will actually be slurred. So not only do they go through this physical experience is that they're suddenly thrown off that their speech is not working the way they expect. And this is a huge opportunity. But one of the things that this instructed and informed us is when we think about AR design, and AR experience design, is this tactile aspect. And I often get frustrated when you know, someone's pitching me the latest uh, haptics type thing where you know, the motor's vibrating or you're supposed to feel a little tingle and that's telling you what's going on. Those kinds of things aren't like touching real objects. And when we had access to, there we go. When we first got access to the HoloLens, the Wave 1 developer, we saw the potential because we had already understood the opportunity that exists when you're working with physical objects. And augmented reality brings us back into this physical world. And we did a number of awesome things in the HoloLens, but this is one of the award-winning experiences we created. This uses a Laridol mannequin. And we actually take the sensors of the mannequin to accurately animate what's happening when you're performing CPR. And this particular application, you know, when we do these things, it's not about demo, it's not about that, it's actually trying to solve problems. This particular application uh, was used in a study of, by University of Pennsylvania in association with Penn Medicine at their Center for Resuscitation Science. The study that was performed and now is, is being published that demonstrates a, a direct feedback and positive outcome of using this type of augmented reality um, experience to reinforce proper CPR skills. And again, you can't simulate CPR waving your hands in the air. If you have ever done CPR, it is strenuous and exhausting. And having this really give you the feedback that you really do need to put that pressure, which you feel like you're going to break someone's chest, the level of pressure required for effective CPR is something that is much more than people think or consider. And experience like this helps communicate that. So as we go deeper and beyond that, these types of experiences, the CPR is one type of use case. But another here, this is with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, is for uh, treatment of sepsis, septic shock. And the challenge with this type of care is that when you're dealing with uh, pediatric patients, we're dealing with young children who are experiencing sepsis, is to treat this, you have to provide a carefully measured, deliberate amount of fluid. And it can contain everything from antibiotics to other solutions that go and help address septic shock. So working with Children's Hospital, what we did here is we integrated with a flow meter. You see the syringe there. We have a flow meter that's integrated. So we're not simulating the movement of fluid. We actually have fluid in the syringe, in this case, saline. We have saline in a syringe that is used to provide direct feedback that as they are uh, moving the syringe, pushing the syringe, they'll see the impact on um, the circulatory system of the uh, child patient. And this is giving them feedback in the care setting. This is currently the studies in progress right now using and leveraging this. But this is something that requires a lot of experience to get right. And here we're using the augmented reality to deliver that. And what happens then, and this, this animation, simplified animation here shows you, is that as you see the action of the heart, you see the impact of your uh, injecting fluid. And it was challenging for us because we had to, uh, we don't design hardware, but we do a lot of Arduino and uh, Raspberry Pi pieces, finding the right kind of sensor that had to so accurately and minutely measure uh, that uh, syringe action. 
And uh, oddly enough, the part we used and end up coming up with that is uh, the same flow meter that's used in Keurig coffee machines. Entirely suitable for this. Which also, that Keurig will have the same effect on your circulatory system. Uh, so here, uh, here it is very much in action as nurses have been put through the experience. It's something, it's some, this falls in the category of doing this in real life is dangerous. Here we have something that makes it safer and informative as they're providing this care. Right here, uh, now we get to our surgeons and physicians. Uh, this is actually a military photo of a, a, a surgical microscope. Surgical microscopes weigh about 700 pounds. This is a challenge for uh, the Department of Defense and that getting a 700 pound surgical microscope to a combat zone isn't really viable. It's also a challenge that there are people in this world who need care that it's very difficult to get them to a surgical microscope versus you know, the opportunity to bring the surgical microscope to them. So here, what we've created, working with a spin-out from shop called x Medical with uh, brilliant Godfrey Nazareth, uh, this system is a portable surgical microscope that uses, in this case, uh, Epson uh, smart glasses. You see here on this stand here, this is being used at uh, Penn Vet uh, for veterinary medicine for evaluation. On that little stand there, this thing that fits in a piece of uh, carry-on luggage, fully self-contained batteries and all, provides a, a 3D stereoscopic uh, view of the surgical site and also provides augmented reality embellishments on top of that from the processing of the images to identifying things like heart rate. Uh, it's pretty wild the kind of feedback this has had. And here's another, uh, another person working with it. This type of technology, you know, to do this, this will greatly improve access to this type of level of care because it's a lower cost to manufacture than these Leica-built, very expensive surgical microscopes. And also, its high portability really opens up opportunities. And to really show as it's advanced, we use a NVIDIA Xavier uh, because of the AI pieces that the system performs. All the stuff on the desktop is relatively relevant. The surgical microscope now, the current ugly working prototype, as we call it, it's still in prototype stage there and used for studies and research. That is using an NVIDIA Xavier uh, processor that has, I think it's 512 cores, which we use for the various AI functions to deliver this whole experience running through the uh, Epson Vario. And as the system is shrunk down, also using this, and see on the left here, you see a surgeon using traditional loops. On the right, that is a set of loops that leverages the same technology stack. We've been putting uh, smart glasses and these other devices on surgeons for a while. And it's interesting the kinds of opportunities that open up when you incorporate deep learning. And uh, separate from x Medical, working on a system that takes care of the inventory, setup, sanitation, such all required around surgery. And what we're doing, this is actual uh, grab from HoloLens, is that we are taking the uh, various elements, we can identify the instruments using a, a deep learning setup and identify the instruments that have been used and returned and the ones that have not for doing counts of making sure that everything went into the patient comes out of the patient, which is a key thing. But uh, this system is currently in development uh, with our organization here in Boston. We're really excited to see how these pieces come together because technology combines, as we mentioned, you know, coffee flow, flow detection, all these different elements, a lot of these solutions acquire many different layers of thinking. I wanted to share one more here. Uh, Looking Glass, which they've past presented Aria. Looking Glass is a volumetric holographic display, and I did promise that we were going to go smaller. Uh, we've actually been creating um, healthcare-related training experiences using this 3D volumetric display. And even figure gestures we can go through, and you can go and point and slide along there. We're not quite at the stock photo video level of things yet. But really, this kind of display and solution we talk about, and Jeff hit this well, there's a lot of degrees to what takes place here with uh, augmented reality and the kind of potential that's out there. And it's just a sampling of some things we work on. I'd be happy to speak to anyone as you're wrestling with your own challenges, making all these things work. Uh, 
my contact information here is on the uh, final slide. I want to thank you all for the opportunity, and uh, go Aria. Thank you.